Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a Kingkiller Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, episode 33, Down the Tunnels, where we will be looking at chapter 68 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of tunnel vision. A quick programming note, if we sound a little echoey or a little bit different than we normally do on our podcast, it is because we are out of our house and in someone else's. A dear friend has offered her home up for us to get a little bit of time away from the normal confines of our space, and we have graciously taken her up on that. And there's a beach nearby. Change of scenery does you wonders. Absolutely. If you are new here, welcome. A little bit of explanation of our podcast. Each week we will examine a section of the book, The Name of the Wind, through a chosen lens, and figure out what we can take from the text to apply it to our real lives. That being said, we are close er, about page 500, and eventually we will get to The Wise Man's Fear. We will also take some time to explore models of practical wisdom from the text with an Aristotelian for Nemos of the Week, after which we will expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact, and wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books, though we are not opposed to this changing should anyone from his team reach out and say, hi, we like you. Secondly, our discussions naturally assume that you have either A, read all of the books, The Name of the Wind, The Wise Man's Fear, The Lightning Tree, and The Slow Regard of Silent Things, or B, somebody has a memory flash device in your vicinity and after you listen to our podcast, you are planning on letting them use it on you. Needless to say, beyond this point, here be spoilers. Also, a quick word to our community, we highly recommend and encourage critiquing the text as written, but we would encourage our listeners to remain kind and understanding towards the author responsible for it. We know that everyone wants the next book. We want the next book. We are not owed the next book. And now, hopefully you are not tired of my voice, because it is time for a 45 second recap of this week's section, as said by me, with little to no preparation. You're welcome. All right, I've got my timer ready, and this may be a prime opportunity to get some more raspberries in the house. So are you ready? Sure. In three, two, one, go. In a chapter that I think touches on every single female character that is named in this story, at least that has more than a page, we get to have Quoth get a nice cloak from Fella. We get to see Denna leave the Aeolian. We get talk of Davy and how Quoth is kind of pissed that he doesn't have a chance to pay her back. And we also get Mola and Ari interacting at the end of the chapter. Done. 35 seconds. Not bad for just pulling something out without thinking about it, huh? No raspberries anyway. Yeah, but it might have been a little bit of a cheat. Either way, it works. I'll accept it. We're just going to be all in a relaxed space. Beach episodes are fun. <laughs> and echoey. <laughs> Let's get into it. Maybe I'll give you a chance to speak now. It's all right. I'm enjoying just being able to relax here on a couch instead of sitting on the floor in our studio, so. <laughs> our studio, <laughs> our spare bedroom. Tomato, tomato. So we chose this week the theme of tunnel vision because it's a theme that accurately describes many of the characters in this section. First of all, obviously there's Quoth. He's pretty wrapped up in his share of problems right now to the point where he's not doing a great job of noticing the people around him. Not that this isn't understandable after everything he's been through, 
but it is definitely something that's causing him problems. But Quoth isn't the only one with tunnel vision here. We've also got Fella, who's got a little bit of tunnel vision herself after going through her own ordeal in the fire in the fishery. And I'd like to touch on that a bit in particular once we get there, because I think that she has some of these anxieties that I think a lot of us would have. And I think that she is a good example of someone that knows and feels that they are capable when given a hypothetical situation, but feels like once they have their feet in the fire, so to speak, they didn't do what they always professed that they would have. And it's an interesting thing to point out in a story like this. And then, of course, we've got Ari, who has her own sometimes literal tunnel vision because she lives her life in tunnels, and how she perceives things perhaps maybe a little bit differently than other people do. And then we've also got Mola, who has her own tunnel vision about how care should be provided. And each of these characters approach challenges to this in different ways, as we'll discuss. Before we really get into the deep dive, you noticed something when we were wrapping up the last episode, things that I've cut because it was our prep for this episode. Chapter 68 in the book that I have physically in my hand that I am looking at and I swear I can read, the chapter name is The Ever-Changing Wind. And you said, I don't think that that's the right chapter because yours is different. Yeah, my chapter is listed as Through the Fire, and I have the ebook edition, which is a little different. Didn't you also check in the 10th anniversary copy, the nice one that we don't mark up? Yes, the one that I don't highlight to crap. Yeah, that one also says Through the Fire. So I'm not sure when this particular copy that we got used at, I think, Powell's came into existence, but um, the chapter for 68, the name of it is incorrect, it seems. Anyway, rather than just talking about the chapter name, let's get into the story. The revised chapter name of Through the Fire, I think actually is really good at explaining how situations of crisis can create a sort of tunnel vision effect on how we view our immediate past. So in this case, Quoth is thinking pretty much exclusively in crisis mode. He's thinking about the debt that he has to Davy. He's thinking about his expenses, how he's going to get another change of clothes, another pair of shoes. He's thinking very narrowly about his own bare survival. And he's kind of blind to the concerns of other people at this point. He's also walking around with a dark cloud over his head. He's not being very nice to anyone. He's just grumbling at everybody because his circumstances are crappy. And I think after everything he's endured, one can forgive him a little bit of grumpiness. The novelty of playing hero faded quickly. I think that that's a good description even of Coat, or Quoth in the time of Chronicler. Yeah, the whole notion of being a hero seems really great when everyone is singing your praises, but then when you have to go walk home barefoot with a whole bunch of burns all over your legs... And your arms and your hands... Yeah, that uh, there's no glory there. There's just a lot of pain and discomfort. I had worked myself into such a grim mood. I think that that's something that happens a lot, is you can work yourself into those moods. It's harder to get yourself out of them. He's in that stage where he has been so zeroed in on his own hardships that he's not looking past them to see opportunities or to see things that maybe might change how he feels about the world. My mood spiraled downward. The only thing that could possibly, according to him at this moment, make his mood better is the hypothetical chance of seeing Denna again, which I think that new relationship energy, even as it's not a strictly romantic relationship, it's more of a darty flirty relationship between both of them, very cautious, very toes in the water. I think 
if it weren't full of that new relationship energy, it might not even be something that would really raise his spirits. Because if their interaction was anything less than perfect, the reality of something that he wanted not being what he wanted it to be might make everything worse. Yeah, one of the parts of new relationship energy is that you build sort of a tunnel vision version of the other person. This idealized version that narrows into just the things that you like about them while oftentimes ignoring the parts of this other person that are maybe a little more complex and textured than you'd like or than you perceive. So he goes to the Aeolian. He once again gets his hopes up. And instead of Denna, he finds Fella. And while not a disappointment, is also not the elation that he was seeking. Their conversation is pretty awkward. Fella is incredibly thankful to Kvothe for pulling her out of the fire. Rightly so. And I like this interaction a lot because Kvothe is not being boastful and saying, well, of course I saved you, and of course I did all of these things. He's telling her, I'm sorry that I bumped you on the floor. I'm sorry that I didn't do this quite right. I've been trained all my life as this theater kid who knows all of these epic stories where the hero is graceful and suave, and instead, Kvothe is the equivalent of our cat Sokka, who is none of those things. He is a big thud, and Kvothe is kind of a big thud in his rescue attempts. It worked, but it wasn't gallant. Again, he's a 15-year-old kid. He's not full-grown yet. He's still awkward and gangly, as most kids are at that age. And that includes both socially and physically. So, Fella did something that is very similar to something that I do every time that you apologize to me or ask me if it's okay if you do something like play a video game. Is it okay if I play this video game that you have wanted to watch me play? Yeah, what? <laughs> Why are you asking? Nobody's doing anything right now, but it's instead of saying, hey, I'm going to do this thing, you're like, hey, can I do this thing? And I'm like, it's your house. Of course you can do this thing. That's my internal monologue. But instead, what I normally do is tell you, no, no, you cannot do that thing that you want to do. No, it's completely awful and, and wrong and you should never do the things you want to do ever. <laughs> and Fella kind of does this. She put on a fierce expression and said, well, I expect you to do a better job next time. A girl gets her life saved and she expects gentler treatment all around. <laughs> and it just reminded me of how we interact. One other thing that I really appreciated about this is Fella has got a fair amount of self-awareness here. She's talking about a lot of narrative tropes that people associate with a rescue situation. She's someone who's thought of herself for a long time as being completely self-sufficient. And she's been in a situation where that agency didn't come into play, where someone else rescued her. And, you know, I think there's a bit of commentary on the self-rescuing princess, which is a response to the princess in the tower. And no matter how capable we are, Everyone at some point in their life is rescued by someone else. She says, I was just standing there like one of those silly girls in those stories that my mother used to read to me. I always hated them. There are a lot of people who profess to hate or be disappointed in those kind of tropes, those typically girls in those stories that don't do for themselves what a man can do for them, which is namely get them out of a situation where they are in danger. But I think that a lot of people have those same attitudes towards, but I would do something different. I would make sure that I got out without the need for another person. It's easy to look from the outside and judge the actions of the people that are on the inside. It's also worth pointing out that in this case, 
she was in a fire. Fire doesn't care whether you are a man or a woman. It doesn't care if you're strong or weak. It doesn't care if you are self-sufficient or not. Based on that, you may be in a situation where you can't get yourself out and you have to rely on someone else. And that other person could be a man, a woman. Again, doesn't really matter. A non-binary pal. Yep, <laughs> exactly. In this instance, Quoth is the one that is in the position where he can help her get out of this situation. And had Fella been the one in the position to use the drench and thus protect herself from the flame to run through it to save Quoth, she probably would have. And it was just a matter of happenstance that their situations were reversed. I think, though, that you're making an assumption that in real life she would have done something like that and not just saved her own skin, which comes down to kind of a cultural assumption that we have. A lot of the times I've noticed in the United States, in response to a tragedy that seems like it should have been preventable, all of the backseat drivers to the tragedy act as though they themselves would have done something different. They would have jumped through the flames, or they would have been the good guy with the gun that stopped the bad guy with the gun. It's individualist behaviors and attitudes versus like a collective, what's better for the greater good or for other people and being selfless. And I think a lot of the times we aspire to stories that have selfless protagonists, or at least protagonists that perform selfless acts. But I don't think that the reality matches up. That's fair. I think Fella has also gotten to see how she performs in a crisis and hasn't been too happy with it. However, we did also get a little bit of interesting knowledge about what Fella's been doing in the fishery. She's been sculpting things specifically for Master Elodin, who has been taking her on as a student and teaching her in his own weird way. He woke her up in the middle of the night and took her to an abandoned quarry north of town, and he put wet clay in her shoes and made her spend the entire day walking around in them. That's just one of the stories. He's eccentric. Well, and it's also telling that Fella is the first of Elodin's students in the next book to actually master a name. In this case, the name of Stone, which fits with the stonework that she's been studying at the quarry and the sculpting she's been doing in the fishery. There's a reason why Fella is so bright. She's very observant, and when she examines the crisis, she is looking very carefully at herself and removing a lot of deceptions. I really like that the gift she gives to Kvoth is a cloak with a lot of little pockets. And I'd say it's pretty clear that Patrick Rothfuss is enchanted by all of the little pockets that he keeps writing about in all of Quoth's cloaks. So recently I watched a video on YouTube and it was a girl that I enjoy watching her vlogs talking about how she went wedding dress shopping. And one of the wedding dresses she tried on had pockets. And that almost sold her on the dress. Pockets are great. And especially considering that this is a medieval society where pockets on any form of clothing is kind of a luxury, even in men's clothing. It does represent extra fabric. Mm -hmm. It takes extra fabric and extra work. So yeah, I can see why it's a rarity. And it's also something that would be appealing to Quoth. And I also think in my heart of hearts, Patrick Rothfuss also enjoys just writing and saying the word pockets. If anyone wants to dissuade us from this theory, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook and YouTube. Contact us. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine the meme. <laughs> you sitting behind a desk with a big banner. Patrick Rothfuss likes writing about pockets. Prove me wrong. <laughs> or change my mind. I think yeah, it's change my mind. Change my mind. <laughs> so at this point, while Fella is putting the cloak around Kvoth's shoulders, Kvoth 
sees a familiar shape. I don't like the way that that is written about because it's Denna. It's a person. Ah. Yeah, the shape is how Michael Myers is referred to in the Halloween movie, so... <laughs> Great, that makes it better. Anyway, one of my other theories is that Denna may or may not be at least familiar with the Fae and may or may not travel through the Fae. Because you'd think that Stanchion and Diok would have mentioned something about Denna being there, and they know who's in their establishment, but Denna just walks out the door without a word. And Quoth immediately assumes that Denna assumes that Fella is flirting with him. He wants so badly to just go and run and explain as though he did something wrong by having a friend or having, you know, an acquaintance who also happens to be a woman. <sighs> anyway, sometimes the way that men are written about is dumb. And, you know, honestly, if that's what Denna truly believes, that is on her. It's not up to Quoth to prove otherwise. On top of that, a lot of these problems would be fixed if he would just talk with her and ask her questions. Yes. On to the next little bit. It took Quoth an entire day and a bit to remember about Ari living below the university and remembering that drains go down. Yeah, there's that tunnel vision again. He's been so wrapped up in his own problems that he hasn't thought about how the fire affected Ari. Or anyone else, really. I mean, I'm sure that there were projects that were in mid-making and reagents and all sorts of very specific, time-consuming things that exist in the fishery that got ruined. How would you like it if you were working on a project in a school-owned building and you worked in the evenings and the next morning after you had gotten through a very difficult, tedious bit of your work, somebody just up and sets fire to it? I would not be happy. I know it was an accident, but at the same time, I have had drawings that I did stolen at school. I did some drawings that I was very, very proud of that took a long time, and I accidentally left my sketchbook in my photography class. My sketchbook remained, but that one drawing that I had set the graphite with hairspray was missing. It was gone. Somebody stole it. That is just cruel. Right. And it broke my heart. I remember this from when I was 17 and I am 38. Happy birthday. Right. Happy birthday last week. <laughs> At the time of this recording. Thank you. But back to Ari. How is she not jumping up into his brain? Oh my God, she lives in the tunnels below the university. And now there is bone tar in the tunnels below the university. It's a pretty big oversight. And then he goes into panic mode. Oh my god, Ari. And he runs off to the Medica. I don't know what he was trying to find or who he was trying to find. But he came across Mola and he's just like, you, come with me. And he's fortunate that Mola is open-minded enough to actually come with him. She points out that this is all pretty sketchy. Quoth has a reputation for having what she called a gilded tongue, and she is not impressed. There's a little bit of hints later on that she may have a thing for um, Davy. So there is a thought that maybe she's lesbian, as though someone who is straight would have to fall for Quoth because Quoth is the protagonist. I think there's a lot of assumptions there that he is that charming, and it might just be that Quoth telling the story makes those assumptions rather than having anything that is actually there. I don't know. There's also that assumption that only someone who is attracted to Quoth sexually could ever be persuaded by him, which that's kind of weird. That's really gross. Yeah, I know. Anyway, he gets 
Mola to come with him up the side of Mains across the roof and tries to get to Ari the only way that he knows how, which is kind of funny because there's a lot of ways in and out of the tunnels, not just in the closed off courtyard. That's just the one he knows. I note that it was a cloudless night and that there was a sliver of moon to light their way. Which, again, calls to Ari's moon connection. I still maintain that she's actually more sun-connected. I also see in this interaction, specifically between Ari and Mola, something that reveals a lot about who Mola is as a person. She's very practical and very compassionate. Her response is that of someone who has been trained to provide care and help for people in need. She has her core set of assumptions about how the best way to care for someone would be. She immediately thinks, oh, hey, let's take Ari to the Medica. Let's put her into the system, so to speak. What sort of people would live down in the tunnels? She has this assumption that living outside of society is somehow bad. But she doesn't put up too much of a fight when Foth points out that Ari would probably just be put into the crockery if she were to go into the Medica or get more exposure to society. And she accepts that that's probably right. In the meantime, I'll do what I can to help her out. And when Ari and Mola interact, Mola takes her seriously. Or at least doesn't outright contradict her. An interesting thing to think about, when interacting as an adult that has no children with a child that is the child of a friend of ours, like we did actually this morning, I don't want to talk to them like they are less intelligent or less curious or somehow lesser human beings, but I do want to talk to them on a level that they want to talk at. Maybe a little above that, but not like, here, I'm going to teach you calculus, kid. But I remember when I was a kid, I liked the people and I was more interested in talking with the people who talked about things that were a little bit more science in nature, more how do things work, and interested in what I had to say, but also interested in teaching me a little bit more about the things that I was interested in. Mola interacts with Ari on a level that Ari wants to interact with people on. She doesn't try to force anything from Ari. She doesn't try to change what Ari's behaviors are or what her attitudes are. When presented with things that we would consider odd, that Mola probably would consider to be odd, she rolls with it. Yeah, she just adjusts her worldview and says, okay, this is how this person is and moves forward. She doesn't try and condescend to Ari. She doesn't talk to Ari like she's a child. She talks to Ari like she is someone who just happens to speak a different language and speak about the world in different ways. So instead of trying to come down to Ari's level, she moves over to Ari and speaks with her where she is. I think that speaks very highly of her as a person. Another sun connection. Speaking to Mola, Ari says, You have sunny hair, like me. Would you like an apple? I like that because instead of coming and rushing at her and saying, Hey, I need to take care of you. Are you okay? Did you inhale smoke? Did you get burned? Blah, 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 blah. Like, Quoth is kind of like that. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Are you okay? Are you okay? Can I bring over a person that can take care of you? Please, 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 please. Mola is like, hi, I'm a person. Please don't run away. I think what we also see here is Mola using a lot of passive observation. She is trying to see Ari as she is and not as she thinks she ought to be. We quickly discover that as tunnel blind as Kvothe can get, Ari is perfectly capable of handling herself and has been able to avoid any 
real discomfort from the fire to the point where really her only problem is that parts of the under thing now smell like cat piss. I like the juxtaposition of Ari seeming like this delicate little thing to be taken care of and her, the whole under thing smells like cat piss now. Very frank, very holy God, yes. You know, all of these things that you look at her and you're like, that's not the words that I expected to come out of your mouth. I like that she isn't some weird trope of a character. And as much as Quoth feels compelled to take care of her, she's perfectly fine on her own. She's been living on her own for years. We assume. We're led to believe. Fair enough. Quoth's assumptions are blinding him to actually seeing her as she is. Ari gets Quoth to play the lute for her and Mola. And in a little weird mirror to something that you have said before about how you've had to play your guitar with a band-aid on your pinky. Thankfully, my injured thumb was on my cording hand where it could be a relatively minor inconvenience, which means it's up on the neck, which means that he is playing correctly by not having to support the neck with his thumb, but rather that his hand can kind of move freely across the strings and across the neck. It's an interesting detail, and I rather enjoy all of the rather minute bits that are talked about in terms of the music that Quoth plays, in terms of his passion for it, and the care that Patrick Rothfuss takes with someone who plays music. Before we leave Ari, she says to Mola, his voice is like a thunderstorm which calls to mind the flame, the thunder, and the broken tree again. There was a fire down in the grates below the fishery. Quoth has a voice like a thunderstorm. There is an apple tree. It is not broken, but there's a tree. Finally, we have a little bit of a wrap-up between Quoth and Mola. And it's pretty clear that Mola is all in on Team Ari. She's already making plans to make sure that she gets some clean clothing, even if it's a little too big for her. Except Ari won't accept secondhand clothing. Which is also interesting, and Mola's response is, huh, she doesn't look very sheldish to me. Mola doesn't take this as something that's an oddity or anything like that. It's just a different cultural set of expectations, and she rolls with it. There's a nice little bow of both taking Mola's arm and letting her support him on the way back to Anchors as he is wrapped in the cloak that Fella got him. That's the first real companionship I've seen him express with a female character. The first bit of trust. And I love that she is a doctor, or at least a medical student. That thought that you can trust science and a healer, and that despite being no nonsense, she is a comfort. Yeah, Mola definitely reminds me of a lot of friends I've known who are nurses. She has that very direct and to the point view of the world, but it's also filled with compassion. And for someone like Quoth, trust doesn't come easy. It's very telling that he actually gives it to her because he's trusted her with some fairly major things about himself at this point. Namely, his friendship with Ari, which he's hitherto kept almost entirely secret. And she's earned that trust ten times over. And you can see why he's able to actually be vulnerable around her. I think it shows some character growth. And on that note, I think it's time for us to talk about our Fornemos. It is your turn. Yep. And so our choices here are, well, it's never Quoth, obviously. Our choices are Fella, Ari, and Mola. Stanchion and Deok show up briefly, but they don't really have much to say. But I had to really go with Mola here, just because she shows the kind of flexibility in her thinking where while she may occasionally get details wrong, her core 
worldview is big enough to encompass a change in those details. For her, the most important thing is to do what is right for her patient, for another person in need. And if what that person truly needs is different from what she would initially expect, she is not married to that expectation. She'll change to find what will work best for her patient. And that's a very difficult thing for a lot of people. I know I struggle with this sometimes. Oftentimes, the help you want to give is not the help that someone needs. Or wants. And you have to be able to accept that. She does a really good job of that here. She doesn't try and argue Ari into accepting a secondhand set of clothes. She just accepts that, oh, she just doesn't do that as a matter of culture or practice or what have you, and then moves on and tries to find other solutions. And she also is quick to disabuse Kvothe of the notion that he has to be solely responsible for Ari's well-being. Also, that Kvothe doesn't have to be solely responsible for his own well-being, that he can lean on others, that he can get help when he needs it. Like we were saying earlier in our discussion, everyone needs help sometimes. Mola is quick to offer that to him, no questions asked, no strings attached. That's a good way to be. I think you chose well. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Speaking of learning about the world, I believe it's your turn to share an interesting fact of the week and see if it impresses Master Elodin. A.K.A. Will. Today, yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you may remember in episode 31, I mentioned that I was tied between three. Hopefully I left that in the edit. If I didn't, let's just put it this way. I was tied between three. I told you one of them two weeks ago, and I will tell you another one today. Did you know that there are two very distinct and different ways that English-speaking people perceive time? Hmm. Now you have my attention. At least in reference to ourselves. Not talking about changing of seasons, talking about how we travel or how time travels. First, I would like to figure out which way each of us perceives time. If I were to tell you that tomorrow's noon meeting has been moved forward by two hours, what time will it be held? I would think that it's being held at 10 a.m. Interesting. 2 p.m. That's how you see it? <laughs> yep. That is what I would say. We have two very different and distinct ways of perceiving time. For those of us that chose 2 p.m., we have what is called the ego-moving perception of time. You see yourself as moving forward through time. For those like you that chose 10 a.m., you have the time-moving perception of time, which means that you view yourself as still and time is moving towards you. Now, obviously we and time are not really moving from place to place, but instead these perceptions are fictive motion, which is the metaphorical movement of an object through space. And the differences in our perceptions have a lot to do with how we interpret this metaphorical movement. People who speak other languages may have other interpretations of how time works in relation to themselves, and this is based on how their language describes time. For example, seeing the past is in front of you and the future behind you. Time, while objectively measured, is subjectively understood, and our perceptions may also switch depending on upcoming events. You may feel like you are moving toward something that you are looking forward to, and like an event you are dreading is coming towards you. Personality assessments have shown that people who have the ego-moving perspective are more likely to feel like they have more agency and that their lives mattered in the grand scheme, where people who have the time-moving perspective feel like events are inevitable and tend to be more fatalistic. Interesting. Another fun study of people who just got off a moving vehicle, like an airplane or a train, show that context may play a role in our perception of time as well. 
as most of the participants answered that it felt like they were moving through time. I'm curious to see how our audience feels about this. Are you on team 2 p.m. or team 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. for life! I, I don't understand. The second that the question was brought up on the video I watched, I'm like, 2 p.m. Of course it's 2 p.m. It's moved forward by two hours. It went forward. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every time someone says this meeting has been moved up by two hours or two days, it always means it's getting sooner rather than later for me. But moved up and moved forward are different concepts. They're used interchangeably in my office, so... <laughs> I still don't understand. Like, I would be late to meetings at that point. <laughs> I'm always early. <laughs> Are you ever four hours early? No. Okay. So, audience, tell us how you land on this scale. Are you team 10 a.m. or team 2 p.m.? We want to know. Let us know on Twitter. At WaystonePod. We're excited to hear. I do find it very interesting that we have different perceptions of time. Well, I'm not surprised. We're two different people. Of course we do. But if it's a coin flip between me and another person, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't both be heads. Yeah, we just have different ways of looking at the world. It's only natural that some of these things would be different. Well, with that, I think it's time for us to start thinking about our seven words from the book, after which I will tell you my seven words from life. There are a number of interesting seven-word sentences in this chapter. I noticed that your copy of the book is not quite as heavily highlighted as it is sometimes, but... You are correct. I don't have anything in orange. They were there if you know where to look for them. So consider the following. We have The Dreams of Fish and Sailor's Songs. Ooh. We have This One Has a Wish Inside It. I love Ari. We also have I Wouldn't Want to Accidentally Serenade You. Huh. And... I suppose I could stay for that. So, I went for I wouldn't want to accidentally serenade you. Just because it's slightly cheeky, it's funny, and it's also acknowledging that you don't necessarily want to give people the wrong impression. I think that that's really neat. Yep. <laughs> All of those happened around Ari. As I say, you just have to know where to look. <laughs> So you are tasked with finding seven words from life. What do you have? So my seven words from life this week. You sent me 31 photos of cats. Yes, I did. On our little chat between ourselves on Messenger. Occasionally, Will will send me just a photo dump of other people's cats. Specifically the ones that are the cats of his coworkers. And it never fails to make me just very happy and to smile if I'm having a hard day, if I'm having a happy day, if all I've done that day is play video games, which highly recommend taking some time to do that. I get a little notification. I look 31 photos of cats. And because this is an audio medium and not a visual one, you cannot see the absolutely delightful smile on Will's face right now. But it's there. My coworkers have many cats, and uh, we all have a Slack channel dedicated to sharing pictures of said cats. So it's always nice to share that joy with uh, people I love. Oh. Let us know if you'd like to see more pictures of our cats. I'm happy to post them on Instagram or Twitter for your viewing pleasure. Absolutely. And with that, I would like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone as we discuss chapter 69, nice, of the name of the wind through the lens of looking without seeing. Because we're 12, nice. <laughs> hey, if I'd have said it. <laughs> yeah, you would have said it. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and with that, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we enjoy exploring. Audio production and editing, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. 
Project Management and Writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support our show, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get access to our show notes, early access to the podcast, special Patreon-only bonus pods, and other exciting items. And with that, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. Quoth is the one who is in the position to use the drench to wet himself and... Okay, that sounded terrible. <laughs> I was like, pee himself?